Welcome to Prince of Peace Lutheran Church on this third Sunday of Epiphany. I'm Pastor John Morris, one of the pastors here at the church. If you're a member of Prince of Peace, you should have received our annual report uh, by email this uh, weekend, so please take a look at that. If you'd like a hard copy of that annual report, it's available in our drop-off cabinet here at the church. All that's in preparation for our annual meeting. That meeting will be virtual this year. We'll be doing it on the weekend of February 6th and 7th. And what we'll have you do is simply watch uh, the annual meeting. And if you agree with things, you'll just email us that you watched it and concur with the business. And in preparation for that meeting, again, which is two weeks from today, one week from today at 1215, we'll also have our annual finance meeting. Uh, Chris Joes, our treasurer, will explain to you where we've been with our finances, both expenses and income uh, in this past year. But for those of you who aren't members of Prince of Peace, you don't need to do any of that. You can simply enjoy us now for worship on this third Sunday of the Epiphany. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by grace alone you call us and accept us in your service. Strengthen us by your Spirit and make us worthy of your call through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. A reading from Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nivea, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. 
So Jonah set out and went to Nivea, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nivea was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, Forty days more, and Nivea shall be overthrown. And the people of Nivea believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, 
and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. Thanks be with God. Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. He went a little farther. He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. St. Paul writes, For the present form of this world is passing away. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All three of our scripture lessons for today deal with change and the way that people react to that change. In the book of Jonah, God changes his mind and does not destroy the city of Nineveh. In the Corinthian church, they are struggling with the kinds of changes that will be needed for Christ's imminent return. And then finally, in the Gospel of Mark, Whole lives are thrown into upheaval as Jesus changes their occupations and calls them into full-time discipleship. I'd like to take a few minutes today and look at these instances of change and the effect that it had upon these biblical figures and then maybe look at the question about how changes today might affect us. And how might we respond in the midst of change as the people of God? Well, first of all, Jonah. I'm sure you know the story. Jonah is asked by God to do some prophetic work. And what does he try to do? He tries to get out of it, to go to a different place than God had sent him. But as we know, eventually God catches up with Jonah in the form of a large fish and deposits him exactly in the place where God wanted him to go, the city of Nineveh. And since he's there anyway, Jonah decides to do the Lord's bidding. He tells the people of Nineveh to repent, to change their ways, or receive punishment from God. And to Jonah's great surprise, and perhaps even to God's surprise, The people of Nineveh actually repent. They turn around. They fast. They even put on sackcloth, that sort of burlapy stuff that is very scratchy. Ouch. But because they repent, God decides not to destroy them or their great city. Jonah's reaction to the change, he pouts. Because God did not do what Jonah said that God would do, Jonah sits outside the city and sulks like a baby. Chapter 4 of Jonah, which are the verses immediately after our reading for today, begin with these words, quote, What God did was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. The Hebrew actually doesn't say that Jonah became angry. The Hebrew says that his nose became hot. 
but we get the idea. Poor Jonah. He finally gets a full head of steam going and cries out God's judgment against the city. And then they change their ways. And God changes his mind. Jonah throws a temper tantrum. Sometimes when we don't like change or the change proposed isn't what we would have proposed, we too can end up pouting and whining and get a little crabby. Yes, possible? In our second lesson today, Paul and actually a lot of the early church believed that Jesus was coming back very soon. And because Paul and others thought that Jesus would return to this earth so soon, his counsel to the people of Corinth is not to dilly-dally around with the stuff of this world, but to simply get ready for the advent of our God. So Paul tells them, if you're not married, don't bother. If you've got a funeral to plan, forget about it. Party to throw, shopping to do, business to take care of, set that all to the side. For Paul, all that they needed to be doing was to spend every moment getting ready for Jesus and telling others to do the same. Of course, we now know that Jesus did not, in fact, come back right away. A few thousand years have now passed between the time he walked the earth, ascended to heaven, but he hasn't come back here yet. We're still waiting. But what would change in our lives if Jesus was just about here? I wonder if maybe we'd clean up our act a little bit, put aside some of the grudges we've been holding, maybe give some forgiveness where it is needed and even seek forgiveness for some things that we're not really too proud of. What change would be needed for the kind of change that the appearance of Jesus in our midst would bring? Would we change like St. Paul asked the church of Corinth to change? And now to the gospel. It doesn't appear that Simon and Andrew or James and John think twice about the kind of change that is going to be required of them. Jesus calls them and boom, they drop everything and follow him. They are fishermen, so their nets and boats are immediately abandoned. James and John, according to the gospel, even leave their father sitting there in the boat. They don't go back home to pack a bag or say goodbye to mom or grab a few bucks for the road ahead. They literally just follow. That moment, that instant, they go right with him. Jesus calls, and according to the Gospel of Mark, without hesitation, they follow. So three different stories, three different kinds of change, three different reactions, reactions to the change. Jonah pounded, the church at Corinth got things in order, the disciples hightailed it after Jesus. In each of these stories, God is moving in different ways, sometimes calling for repentance, sometimes for preparation, sometimes for obedience. And I believe that God is moving in these ways even yet today calling us to follow or to repent or to prepare for his coming among us. And what strikes me about each of these stories that we've just gone through, like the call of Samuel last week, is that discipleship at its heart is first and foremost about listening and then responding to the word of the Lord. Jonah listens but he really doesn't want to hear what God is telling him to do. Finally, God forces him, literally, to do what he wants him to do. The people of Corinth are sorting out what it means to be a follower of Jesus and what it will mean for them as they gather and wait for the Lord's arrival. How much can they have on their plates and still be ready for Jesus to come back? The disciples are busy with their work, which is fishing, but not so busy that they can't hear and heed the call of the Lord. 
And the minute Jesus snaps his fingers, they fall right into line. By the way, just so we're clear, the disciples won't always do exactly what Jesus asked them to do. And what about us today? During this pandemic, your staff and church council have been doing a lot of listening. We've been listening to the voices in the congregation, to information provided to us by scientists and medical professionals, and to God's call to be the church in this time. I have to say that sometimes it's hard to hear God in the midst of the cacophony of voices. I do hear what people are saying in our congregation, but I also try to balance that with what other community leaders and scientists are saying. People send me details about the latest medical advances. Others remind me of what other churches are still willing to do in the pandemic that we are not willing to do. And to be honest, I have my own demons and shortcomings to deal with. Why do I keep coming into the office when there's really so little to plan for? Why should I keep my energy up in the midst of just one disappointment after another? Wouldn't it be better just to sort of shut down and tune out the noise of the world? How do we listen to what God is calling us to do in the midst of so much change? Sometimes, like old Jonah, I get angry and just want to pout. Sometimes, like those in Corinth, I want to make a list of everything that we need to do and make sure we're ready. Sometimes I just want to drop everything and just blindly follow like Simon and Andrew and James and John did. I know that during this pandemic, I'm sure I've not made all the correct decisions. I don't know anyone who has. Initially, I have to confess that I thought this would all be over quickly. And so maybe I was slow to make changes that would have helped early on. I thought the closure would just be temporary, a couple of weeks. Then, later, I think I got comfortable with new patterns. And maybe could have changed things up and tried harder. I'm not sure. I don't know. But I do know this. I have not made a single decision without praying about it without consulting other leaders of this church and, what, and without listening for what God would have us do in the midst of all this change. And isn't that finally what we are called to do? I mean, sometimes change upsets us. Sometimes it empowers us. Sometimes it rearranges us in the world around us. But as long as we continue to search for God in the midst of the change, I. I do think that God will be there to speak to us once again. Paul writes to the Corinthian church, the present form of this world is passing away. Things are changing. Things are always changing. Things have been changing for millennia. Our job is to look for God and God's grace in the midst of all the change. And then once we find God's word, to hold on to that with all we've got. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let us confess our faith and the faith of the church in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For the church throughout the world, for pastors and teachers, for deacons and deaconesses, and for musicians and servers, that all proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love, let us pray, have mercy, O God. For skies and seas, for birds and fish, for favorable weather and clean water, and for the well-being of creation, that God raise up advocates and scientists to guide our care for all the earth, let us pray, have mercy, O God. For those who provide leadership in our cities and around the world, for nonprofit and non governmental organizations, for planning commissions and homeless advocates, that God inspire all people in the just use of wealth, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For those who are sick, distressed, or grieving, for the outcasts and all who await relief, that in the midst of suffering, God's peace and mercy surround them. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For our congregation and community, for families big and small, and for the organizations that meet here during the week, that God's steadfast love serve as a model for all relationships. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. In thanksgiving for our ancestors in the faith, whose lives serve as an example of gospel living, that they may point us to salvation through Christ, let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or loud, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God.
Blessed are you, O holy God, you are the life and light of all. By your powerful word you created all things. Through the prophets you called your people to be a light to the nations. Blessed are you for Jesus, your son. He is your light, shining in our darkness and revealing to us your mercy and might. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering therefore his preaching and healing, his dying and rising, and his promise to come again, we await that day when all the universe will rejoice in your holy and life-giving light. By your spirit bless us and this meal, that refreshed with this heavenly food, we may be light for the world, revealing the brilliance of your Son. Through him, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. And now we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. At this time, we turn to the distribution of the sacrament. Uh, if you picked up one of our uh, um, pods here at the church, you're welcome to get that out now. Or if you have your own bread and wine or bread and grape juice at home, that's also fine. So if you'll peel back uh, the top layer, it reveals the wafer. This is the body of Christ given for you. And then likewise the foil. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Christ Jesus, at this table we have feasted on your very life and are strengthened for our journey Send us forth from this banquet, nourished in body and in spirit, to proclaim your good news and to serve others in your name. Amen. God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace. Amen.
Go in peace, be the light of Christ. Thanks be to God.